All right, I think we will get started. Um, we still have a few uh, people that will be um, coming in. So <laughs> I'm doing both things at the same time. Um, just a heads up for everyone. So uh, thank you for joining us for the part four of our architectural seminar series that we've had going since last November. Um, this is the politics of brutalism. We're really excited about this one um, and excited that we've had such success with all four of these. Um, my name is Jennifer Gursky. I'm the program and technology manager at the Madison Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the organization, you can at madisonpreservation.org, or you can email us anytime at info at madisonpreservation.org. Happy to answer any questions. A couple of housekeeping items. Uh, everyone is muted for the presentation. And uh, as soon as Bob finishes, um, we will take questions. So uh, you'll be able to put questions in the chat, or um, you'll be able to also unmute yourselves um, after uh, Bob's finished. So our speaker tonight, as many of you uh, hopefully read on the website already, um, Robert Bruchman is a distinguished professor emeritus of art history and architecture and urban planning at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's also the author of many books and articles. Um, hopefully you all saw the On Wisconsin uh, article that uh, just came out. We posted to our Facebook page, terrific piece. Um, and um, Bob, uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, take it away. My pleasure. Hello, everybody. Um, okay. Jennifer, do we have the screen up as it should be? Yes. Okay. Everyone should be able to see it. Yep. Um, the, the previous presentations in this series have largely been about identifying a style and then talking about examples in Madison. But for this presentation, what I'd like to do is something quite different. I'd like to focus on the very idea of style and what it means to have a style, who invents the style, and for what reason. Um, and I'd like to do this using this very curious term, brutalism. Now, let me warn you in advance that this is kind of a complicated story, so um, pay attention. <laughs> And now, okay, let's start here um, with a building that I imagine that is well known to many of you listening to me this evening. This is, of course, the Humanities Building at University of Wisconsin, designed by Harry Weiss and Associates, finished in the turbulent year of 1969. Uh, this is a building that has often been called brutalist in style. For many, it represents all of the things they dislike about this style. They have found it overly large, raw, off-putting, confusing, dark. This perception contributed to a decision by the university in a master plan of 2005 to demolish the building. But is this building brutalist and are these judgments fair? Let's first say something about the architect. Harry Weiss was born in 1915, went to MIT, started practicing right after World War II. His early buildings were light, often fairly whimsical buildings. He was heavily influenced by Mies van der Rohe, by this kind of minimal modernism. Um, and by the way, he did quite a few buildings in Wisconsin. So um, this one in Shadow Cliff uh, near, um, Green Bay, here's the St. Thomas Episcopal Church in Menasha. He had a major interest in historic preservation and in historic architecture. And I think more than almost any architect of his generation, he was willing to use historic forms, but usually abstracted and modernized. As the years went on, his buildings tended to become um, bigger and somewhat heavier, often moving from steel to concrete. This followed trends that many um, architects of the day uh, were doing. His masterpiece, which was designed and built um, at the same time that the humanities building was going up, uh, was the Washington Metro system. Um, this building, or this, I guess it's a construction, it's, a, it's a, almost a piece of uh, um, city uh, building. Um, I think these um, spaces that he built for this are, in my opinion, one of the greatest works of architecture of the 20th century. Um, 
and they mirror, I think, in a, in a way, the earlier architecture, classic architecture, but again, uh, modernizing it. And notice that it's all concrete. Okay, this brings us then back to the master plan for the South Lower Campus of University of Wisconsin. You see it there on the left in white. Um, and you can see that it's a big chunk of building. Um, the idea here was that he was going to um, create a complex that would house art, music, and history. That was a lot to put into a single building. Here's a, a model, um, and you can see the um, humanities building at the top, and then uh, the museum um, down at the bottom. Um, one of the problems here was this building continued to grow. It got bigger and bigger and bigger as more and more things were added. But I think it's pretty clear from this um, sketch that um, Harry did that he very much intended this building to fit in. Um, he wanted to keep the cornice line even with the other buildings that were around it, um, the massing, even putting a limestone on the top of the building um, to mirror the buildings that were around it. Designed about 1966, finished in 1969, there were problems at the very beginning. Um, heating, ventilation, um, I don't really know whether these were the fault of the design or fault of cost cutting. I'm suspecting it was mostly the latter. And I think one of the ways to, to test this is to look at the, the museum just to the, um, to the side of it. You see that there on the right-hand side. Um, the museum, which is now the Chasen, I think has always been admired and has had almost none of the problems of the, of the uh, humanities building. I think it's because the, um, there were private donors and they didn't have to do cost cutting. I don't think that either of these buildings was called brutalist at the time, or if they were, most people wouldn't have known the term. Uh, the building was very much in the spirit of the times. There were a few other buildings in Madison that were similar in style. Immediately across the street uh, was a building by um, a local architect um, who became that architect uh, by this time was all, was, had become a, a national architect as well, um, housing communications connected with the bridge. And it looks like um, in this case, the architects were very consciously trying to match the building with the humanities building. And I've really never heard people talk about this in the same negative way that the, they talk about humanities, um, even though it's pretty much of the same style. A few other buildings in town, um, somewhat similar style, same architect as the, um, the building across the street from um, the humanities building um, as well by the same Flat and Associates architect. Now this style um, is particularly interesting to me in for one reason because uh, the campus in which um, I taught uh, is almost entirely built on this model. So the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle was master planned and then most of the buildings were designed by Walter Netsch, a partner at Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. Um, you can see this is all concrete and it's a, a, a kind of a megastructure. A megastructure meaning that it's got an infrastructure, in this case, this second story walkway that connects all the buildings. Um, at the time it was finished, it had mostly good press. It was considered a very authentic and honest modern building complex. Very limited palette, very durable materials, concrete, granite, and glass. Um, it got probably more publicity than almost any academic building, any new campus of the post-war era. A lot of the buildings of this era got very good press. Boston City Hall may have been the most prominent. Uh, Ada Louise Huxtable, who was uh, the wonderful critic of the architecture critic of the New York Times for many years, called it, quote, a structure of dignity, humanism, and power. It mixes strength with subtleties. It will outlast the last hurrah. This is remarkable praise coming from Ms. Huxtable. Um, in 1976, uh, there was an AIA poll. It, became, it came in sixth as the best building, sixth best building in all of American history. 
Another very famous building in the United States uh, was the building by Paul Rudolph at for Yale University, the Art and Architecture Building. Um, again, uh, got extremely good um, reviews when it came out. And this style was really a style that you saw all across the world. Um, interestingly, it seems that it was in Britain that it was first really deployed. And this is probably the place that has the highest concentration of these buildings, but you see it throughout Europe. Um, looking here at the Hayward Gallery in London, here in the outskirts of Paris, a building by the great Brazilian architect Oscar Niemeyer. But for whatever reason, the, the most astonishing examples of this are to be found in the sphere of influence of the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain. Now, part of this, I think, was because concrete was relatively cheap, unlike steel, which was used more in the United States because we had the technology and labor was so expensive uh, that steel made sense. But in much of the rest of the world, concrete was the material of choice. And this was certainly true in the behind, in, behind the, the Iron Curtain. I think it was also a, um, a matter of preference that somehow this massive um, ponderous style must have appealed to communist party leaders and their socialist realist um, uh, ideals. So um, here we're looking at Poland, but you can go all across the Soviet realm and see these um, absolutely amazing um, structures. These have been very little known until just recently. And suddenly there have been um, a lot of books that have come out and that um, show you these. I haven't seen most of these. I'm taking these um, images almost entirely from books. So this, um, now we're in Slovakia. Here we are in Belgrade. Um, Eastern Europe and Asia here in Tbilisi, uh, the Ministry of Highway Construction, absolutely <laughs> astonishing um, pieces of architecture and just now starting to become known. Now, at the time these buildings were constructed, as I've said, the press was mostly positive. Now, some people were unhappy from the beginning. At the Yale Art and Architecture Building, for example, um, some observers were absolutely dismayed by the rough concrete. It had been um, bush hammered to give it this, this kind of corduroy texture. You see Paul Rudolph there standing in, in front of the building. A lot of people thought it was not, it was too aggressive, that the edges were so sharp that it would um, uh, cut your shoulder if you scraped, if you happened to brush by it. And it was also a very complicated building with um, multiple levels. And subsequently, when the fire, a fire broke out, uh, urban legend almost immediately had it that the students were responsible and they were the ones that torched it. Now that's probably an urban myth, um, but in all of these cases, brutalism was not a term that was much used. Now it wasn't as if the term brutalism wasn't already around, it had been used primarily in Britain by a small set of architects in the 1950s, the early 1950s. So here's an article from the prominent critic Renner Banham from 1955. Um, but before talking more about brutalism, um, I want to backtrack here a moment and talk about style labels more generally. Now we sometimes think of these terms as just descriptive. Um, if we say, architecture of the classic world, that's simply talking about a time period. But in many cases, these labels were used originally for highly polemical purposes. So for example, during the Renaissance, there was a strong reaction against the architecture of the previous centuries, the Romanesque and the Gothic. By the late, 19, by the late 15th century, Gothic was completely out of fashion. So at Cologne Cathedral, um, construction pretty much stopped. The young Turks of Florence and then elsewhere in Italy and through Europe thought that the buildings like Cologne Cathedral were really barbarous. And so they invented the label Gothic. Now, this was, of course, extremely derogatory because it referred to the nomadic tribes, the Goths, that overran ancient Rome. And for most of Europe in the Renaissance, Rome was the great exemplar of civilization. So this was a very negative term but 
like many art historical terms, a negative polemic eventually became just a standard term in art history. So when we talk about Gothic today, I don't think anyone thinks about it as any connection to the, um, ban the, the nomadic tribes that overran Rome in the fifth century. Same was true with the Baroque. Um, this was from the Portuguese Barroca. It was referring to pearls, but it meant irregularly shaped, misformed um, pearls. And it was used for buildings like this one um, after the Baroque had gone out of fashion and the neoclassical had come in. So labels, style labels are very often weapons. Now, the odd thing about brutalism is that for the people that we were using it at first, it was not a negative polemic. In fact, it was a very positive polemic. Here's the article that came out in 1955 uh, that probably really launched it into the larger architectural world. The New Brutalism by Renner Bannum. Now, what it was referring to um, was the kind of architecture that the young people like the Smithsons, um, Allison and Peter Smithson, were reacting against. And what they were reacting against were the, what they considered the very tepid architecture of post-war Britain. A lot of this architecture was influenced by Scandinavian moderate modernism, using familiar forms, pitch grooves, relatively low buildings, and very human scale. Uh, this was part of a movement called the New Humanism. But many young architects rebelled. They thought it was middle brow. It was uninteresting, not truly modern. And so their remedy was to create something that they called brutalism. And the, the people that really put this on the map was the young couple, Peter and Allison Smithson. They wanted an architect they felt was more honest. It was brutal in its honesty and its simplicity. Uh, their buildings made no attempt to dress themselves up. The materials were left exactly as they were. Um, they didn't even bother to hide a lot of the ductwork, for example. The most important early example of the brutalism was this school at Hunstanton in Britain. It's obviously a utilitarian building, um, and it makes no attempt to be fancy. Um, what you see is what you get. Brutalism wasn't really actually a style as much, as much as it was an attitude. And it was decidedly a positive term about straightforward honesty. Now, several things to notice about this. The first is that the light frame here is very much in the mode of Mies van der Rohe and minimal modernism of the 1950s. For those of you who know um, the IIT campus, this is very similar in, um, in vocabulary to that not at all like what would later be called brutalism. But a few years later, this kind of, you might say humorless attitude about honesty and integrity um, aligned, which aligned perfectly with many of the social and political goals of the political left in the 1960s, um, it in turn um, started to look a little bit suspect, um, it, particularly because it was always about uh, public buildings, mostly um, public housing, um, rather than commercial buildings or houses, and another meaning started to creep in. And what that meaning was, it had to do with a different kind of, a very different kind of architecture. Um, it was the architecture of heavy concrete buildings by people like Le Corbusier, the great Swiss-French architect. Um, this was about as far away from the minimal architecture of the Smithsons, as you can imagine. Uh, these buildings were massive, they were built of concrete, and they were built of concrete in a way that made the concrete very palpable. They weren't, the, the surfaces weren't smoothed over or painted. All the marks of the wooden formwork were still there to be shown, still there to see. Now, in French, this was called béton bru, or raw concrete. And perhaps because of the neat coincidence of the French word bru and the English word brutal, the meaning of the term brutalism soon changed. And it was these buildings of Le Corbusier and big concrete buildings that started to become the way we think of brutalism um, since that day. 
But in the 1950s and in the 1960s, the term remained something of a code word, even a, a kind of an in-joke for a small group of young British iconoclast architects and critics. It probably wouldn't be remembered at all, except for the writings of uh, Renner Banham. Um, this article in 1955, obviously the new brutalism was a mocking reference to the new humanism. And he did a book, 1966, called The New Brutalism. Um, much of it featured buildings that were small and, and quite elegant, um, rather than um, the buildings that later became known as brutalism. But it also included a lot of big housing projects and other um, buildings that were related to the leftist um, political world in, in Britain at the time. Um, and it got this reputation of being about, high, about a high moral position, honesty, integrity, a continuation of the modernist belief that, could, that design could change the world. So this was um, like the modernism of Nice and the modernists of the pioneers in the 1920s was a continuation of this modernist project to change the world building by building by design. But of course, tastes change in architecture as in everything else. And by the time the humanities building was finished or Banham's book had appeared, there was already a major reaction in full swing. It was a reaction against both minimal Miesian modernism. Here's Stanley Tigerman's um, graphic representation of Mises Crown Hall at IIT sinking into Lake Michigan and a, an attack against the heavier concrete buildings. Robert Venturi was one of the earliest voices decrying the work of architects like Paul Rudolph. Uh, this is uh, in his book, Learning from Las Vegas of 1972. He used buildings by Rudolph, like the one you see on the right, as the, um, the object lesson in what not to do in architecture. He said that because the modernists didn't want ornament, they made the whole building ornamental by all of these unnecessary balconies and forms. So what we saw in the 1970s and the 1980s was a major retreat from post-war modernism and the rise of what has become known as postmodernism. Postmodernism, and the good example, good, very good early example here is the Portland building by Michael Graves, um, was a direct attack on the ideals of the modernist, uh, of the post-war modernist. Um, People like Venturi and Graves um, mocked the idea that architecture was going to change the world. Instead, modernism was um, very often ironic, tongue-in-cheek, colorful, filled with ornament, completely the opposite of the deadly earnest buildings of the 1960s. Now, these anti-modernist attitudes led eventually to the rediscovery of the term brutalism. And I don't think it was by architects that it was rediscovered. I think it was by journalists and ordinary people. So toward the end of the 20th century, writers in the popular press in Britain started using the term again. But by then, the original positive connotations of the term had been almost completely forgotten. Instead, the meaning of brutalism was turned on its head and it was used as a negative polemic to vilify big concrete buildings like this one, the Trellick Tower by Erno Goldfinger in the early 1970s. It's a, that was a public housing structure and um, was uh, regularly voted the ugliest building in Britain by the newspapers. It was called the Tower of Terror. Now notice the use of imagery and this is from a, an essay that was done in the, the um, 19, um, 80s, I think, but notice the way the, um, the whole picture is set up to suggest that this building is um, derelict and is um, contributing to this slum um, in, in London, in North Kensington. So soon, um, once this idea got into the air, even the most admired buildings of the 60s and 70s came under brutal attack. Uh, Boston City Hall, for example, a lot of critics argued that it was too big, too confusing, too raw, 
and that it was a product of urban renewal programs, which had wiped out a lot of the central Boston in order to uh, build this structure. Successive mayors called for its demolition. Um, this hasn't happened yet. And I think the building by now is probably safe. On the left, you're seeing uh, the interior of the building, but you're also seeing part of that fabric that was wiped out to create it. So it was not just against the architecture, but it was also against the, the urban renewal projects of the, of the uh, early post-war years. What's, what was um, vilified even more though was the public plaza out front. And this is still enormously controversial. Um, the, the group called the Project for Public Spaces has called it the ugliest open space in the world. The Cultural Landscape Foundation, on the other hand, has named it one of 13 marvels of modernism. Uh, there have been repeated attempts to try to remake it by some of America's most um, celebrated landscape architects. None of it so far has gone very far, um, but uh, I think the verdict is out about what will happen to the plaza in front of Boston City Hall. Now, I think that one of the most important things that has turned people against these big aggressive buildings of the 60s was this claim that their architects and the, the um, people who were talking about brutalism in the 1950s and 60s, um, their claim of moral superiority and the connection with public housing and other kinds of um, programs of the, of the left side of the political spectrum. Um, I think that uh, you're looking there at the Robert Taylor Homes, the, the largest American public housing project. Um, as public opinion changed dramatically against these buildings, um, I think people started to, th to think about modern, uh, brutalism in general as a major problem. I think people even started to believe that the architects like Harry Weiss were making these buildings deliberately brutal, which is just a very peculiar idea. Now, a similar thing happened in Madison. Now, the timing of this building didn't help. Here it is under construction in the late 1960s, just in time for the large-scale demonstrations against racism and the war in Vietnam. So for reasons legitimate and reasons really unrelated to the building, there was a bad taste in people's mouth about a lot of what happened in the late 1960s. By the, over the late 60s, 70s, and 80s, this building started to be called brutalist. Now, when I started doing research for the book, I was writing on Harry Weiss, which was about uh, 10, 15 years ago. I knew all that, but I was still amazed to hear that the building was slated for demolition in the campus master plan of 2005, and it's still slated for demolition. But I didn't realize the full depth of the animus against it until one day when I was standing at just about this spot and I heard a young woman talking to, to a group of prospective students. She was going on and on about how the building didn't fit in, it was dark, forbidding, how brutal it was. And then she repeated a common urban myth that this structure was built to be a fortress so that armed university officials and police could barricade themselves in it in the event of attack by students. Of course, that wasn't true. The, the building was designed in the early 1960s before those um, uh, that unrest, but nothing prepared me for what she said next. She said that the architect humanities building, of course, she didn't have any idea who this was, was so distraught when he saw the completed structure for the first time that he committed suicide by jumping off the roof and was buried in the thick concrete base. Well, I have to give some credit for originality. That was a, this is an urban myth of, of, that I've never heard before. The resurrection of the term brutalism as a negative polemic has had a devastating effect on some of the most acclaimed buildings of the 60s and 70s. Back at my campus, the buildings aged, didn't get proper maintenance, opinion turned against them, particularly against the urban renewal, which was what made the, our campus possible. Opinion ran so high that the university administration decided to demolish one of the key features, the walkway system. They said it was leaking and that steps up to it were crumbling. That was true, but of course it was entirely due to problems of maintenance. Demolition ultimately cost millions of dollars more than rebuilding the stairs and putting in some flashing on the walkways. I think the university administration's decision to proceed wasn't really a matter of, of done for practical reasons. 
I think it was to drive a stake into the very heart of the design. Uh, just looking at these pictures, these magnificent slabs of granite, some of the biggest granite slabs ever um, uh, quarried in the United States, I think this demonstrates the power of architecture, negative as well as positive, and uh, also testimony to the power of a term, because branding the buildings as brutalist played a big part in rallying opinion against them. A lot of buildings that were much loved at the time of construction have been lost in the late 20th and early 21st century. A few examples in um, Baltimore, back in Chicago. And in a few more years, maybe the same thing might have happened here, back at the Trellick building. By, the by this time, by the 1980s, 1990s, the term had become firmly entrenched in popular culture to mean something bad. But at the very same moment, elite opinion makers were changing their mind. Younger architects and more bohemian types looked at Trellick Tower first in amusement, in a kind of camp reaction, that it's so bad it's good. But soon their view of the tower as kitsch turned into genuine admiration. It helped that this was occurring just as Margaret Thatcher, the prime minister, came along and sold off a lot of Britain's public housing. This building had a perfect location for trendy young architects, artists, and hipsters. They moved in and loved it. It became a kind of a cult object and all the more cherished because it's so reviled by the bourgeoisie. And instead of just trying to forget the term brutalism, they turned it on its head once again using it as a positive polemic. I think you get some sense of this cheeky reaction uh, from my favorite brutalism website. And of course, if by 2016, the New York Times says it's back in fashion, it must be so. The result has been a dramatic split in opinion about brutalism, even as the attack on brutalist buildings hit its peak in the popular imagination, a new generation of highbrow types started to campa campaign for it. This attitude eventually permeated the preservation community. Trellick Tower was listed in 1998 as a British architectural landmark. There's been a flood of books on brutalism. And I think this attitude that brutalism is something, um, if not good, at least worthy of preservation as an important um, period piece is starting to filter downward. Um, Recently, there's been a remarkable resurgent. The Yale building has been restored and extended. Um, a critic, um, Nicholas Urasoff, says, now seen in its full glory, this building is now widely considered to be a masterpiece of late modernism. Same is true with Boston City Hall. Um, artists and preservationists have turned to solid admiration of it. But this shift has left um, public opinion in general far behind. Is it inevitable that the way preservationists see historic buildings will be frequently at odds with that of the general public? Is there some other way to build a more solid consensus about what to save? What about some of the current buildings that seem to be entering exactly the same cycle as the humanity building, the humanities building? Um, here's a building, this addition to the Royal Ontario Museum that the architectural magazines loved when it was built, but many ordinary citizens really hate it. They hate it for the same reasons they hated um, and still hate um, brutalism, that it's really aggressive, it's out of scale, um, it makes, uh, almost makes fun of the original buildings of the complex. Will this building go through an active push for demolition, but then a rallying by younger, more radical voices and a big push to save it, if it lasts long enough? Now, let me come back to the humanities building one last time. My guess is that this building is a perfect test case for which view of brutalism will win out. Is this building an example of brutalism, meaning an honest and bold approach to architecture, one that merits protection and rehabilitation? Or is it an example of brutalism, meaning an overly large, aggressive, and raw building that should be demolished and replaced by something more acceptable to current taste? I believe the tide has turned and opinion in the architecture and preservation communities 
is now mostly in favor of saving this building and many brutalist structures. Will popular opinion follow? I'll be curious to see what all of you out there think will happen. Will the change in taste about brutalism happen soon enough to save this building? Or will it come down according to the current plan? And with that, I will um, leave you and um, end of the show. And great, Jennifer, great. how do I get back to <laughs> right back to the screen? Okay, there we go. Am I back? Yes. Okay, very good. Great, fantastic. So I will give you just one second. Um, and we've got a um, some questions coming into the chat. You let's see. Okay, so people should be able to um, unmute themselves also. Um, we do have a couple questions. We have one from Steve. Is there any truth to the rumors that the buildings were designed and built with concrete so that the building could serve as a bunker during the Cold War years of the 60s, 70s, and 80s? Um, no, uh, I don't think. Um, I think that, uh, no, I, I no evidence that, uh, I've never seen any evidence that, that was the case. Usually people talk about it as, as um, a bunker against the students, but uh, no, I hadn't heard that about uh, against, the, against the Soviet Union. I mean, if that were the case, I think that they, um, I think the buildings of the 50s and 60s would have been bunker-like, not the buildings of the late 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, another one we have from Mary. Did Harry Weiss have a studio in Barrington, Illinois? Um, yes, uh, but the, the, the studio was actually that house that I showed, that little, um, that little house with two sides to it, a kind of dog trot out house, that was called the studio. And, and he did work from there, but it wasn't as though there was a, you know, architecture office there. Oh, hi, Mary Lou. I see. I see. This is Mary Lou Seidel. Hello. Hey, Bob. It's great to see you. <laughs> do you do you have the address of that studio in Barrington by any chance? I don't know if it's still there. Or... It is still there. And I have the address. I don't have it at hand, but oh, it's okay. You just send me an email. I'll, I can send that. Yeah, to yeah. You. Thanks. Um, we have a question from Michael. Um, can you recommend a good source for more information about postmodernism? Oh, um, well, the, I think the easiest thing is to uh, look at the books by a, a man named Charles Jenks, J-E-N-C-K-S. Charles Jenks was, uh, wrote uh, these books about postmodernism in the late 1970s that became iconic and I think they're the best definition. Interestingly, postmodernism, um, like the modernism before it, um, went tremendously out of fashion in the 1990s, the aughts, and only recently have people been coming back and, and reevaluating it. So if you remember that um, the Portman building that I showed uh, in, in um, Portland, Oregon, it seems these cycles going faster and faster. And there was a strong move to demolish that building until they finally decided that they were going to um, rehab it. And for all the same reasons, actually, as the, um, as the humanities building, the offices were too small, the windows were too small, the HVA system, HVAC system didn't work very well. So it's, it's, it's like a constant cycle of change. And the ironic thing is that there's this period between when buildings are thought of as new and the time when they become thought of as historic that they're most liable to be knocked down. And um, that means that they never really get their day in court. Okay. Um, a, another question we have is, um, as a member of the general public, what's the way to support, what's the best way to support brutalist architecture going forward? 
Well, I think it, um, the, the best way to do this is to join the National Trust, the uh, Madison Trust for Historic mm -hmm. Preservation, the uh, Dokomomo, uh, the Documentation of Building of the Modern Movement. Um, these organizations are, um, uh, I think all of them practically have now embraced brutalism and are trying to save the most important examples. But it's, you know, it's always a case by case thing. It, it's, it's conceivable that there's nothing that can be done with humanities. I rather doubt that because um, there have been um, preservation challenges that were seemingly insurmountable that um, if there's enough, uh, if there's enough will to save them, you almost always can. Great. Uh, we have another question here in the chat from Richard. Do you agree that the um, BCH is one of is the most or one of the most important buildings of the 20th century? BCH, oh, Boston City Hall. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yes, I I think it is. Um, I I think that. For a period of time, there was this idea that, that public buildings should be all glass, so they were trans literally transparent. But then I think that got to be uh, so common and, uh, and it lost all of the monumentality we um, expect from public buildings. So I think that uh, Boston City Hall was an attempt to regain some of that uh, monumentality, but as well be a really good way to get a lot of people into the building through various um, parts of the building and make it much more friendly to um, a lot of people moving through the, the, those spaces. Um, I think any building that was had as much really good press at the time, and for example, that review by A. Louise Huxtable is bound to come back at some point. So yeah, I would say that it probably is one of the great buildings. Okay, another question from Andrew. Has a National Register nomination for the humanities been considered? Would that affect the likelihood for preservation? Oh, it would certainly affect the likelihood whether it would ever get through um, is another matter altogether. And I think that there have been some attempts to, um, to put it on the National Register. Um, I think for, for at least the last 10 or 15 years, um, there have been these kind of sputtering attempts by various people to, to do something with it. Um, whether or not they, any of that comes to pass, I don't know. Uh, one of the things that, that is really conspicuous to me is that if you look at the University of Wisconsin, a lot of nice buildings, but actually very few buildings by famous architects. So whether you like humanities or not, it's at least a major monument of a particular style by a, a major architect. So that right there may be an argument for saving it, even if it could be a terrible place to, to work. I don't know what you would do with those little music rooms, for example. I think that um, what's really needed more than anything, perhaps, is some architects to get in and, and get some plans for what the university could do with it. Uh, let's see, Erica, uh, most modern buildings seem to require explanation for people who appreciate them. I'm thinking about the Chicago Architecture Foundation's modern tour. How to bring, um, how to bring people around fast enough? I guess, how would you, how would we bring around, people around fast enough to? Well, you know, I think that's actually happening. Um, if you consider um, in Chicago, for example, Chicago Architecture Foundation, uh, does it's like um, industrial strength tours uh, that they were doing up until the pandemic. Um, um, incredible numbers of people. And if you go around the country to, let's say to Miami Beach with the Art Deco or to Palm Springs where I am currently with the mid-century modern, um, or you go to Barcelona um, with the Gaudi buildings, mm -hmm. I, I think that there's been more interest in architecture than ever before. And so um, I think there's a real chance that this split between the architecture world and the and the um, general population might um, might narrow. And by the way, I don't think that the architects are always right. I mean, I think, for example, personally, I think that Liebeskind edition in Toronto is just a just a rude thing to do to a very nice building. But uh, and I think maybe in many cases the public has been right all along and the architects wrong. But I think um, more dialogue here is probably what is going to make uh, some common cause. Mm 
All right. Uh, we have a question from Bob. I saw something in The Guardian where they seem to be saying that Northern England was a primary source of brutalism. There was a concern now that many buildings were not being kept up and seemed to be thinking that the buildings were there were seriously endangered. Was Northern England really a big original source? Yes, absolutely. And I don't know why exactly it is, but Britain generally and Northern Britain particularly and maybe it was the worst place for um, brutalism because it's gray and it's dark and it's cold. And uh, I think these buildings would look a lot better in, uh, let's say, Rome or Naples than they do in Northern Britain. And, and they use them for some really strange things like great big car parks, for example, was a, there was a fashion for these um, enormous concrete buildings for multi-story car parks. And those are about as difficult to figure out how to reuse as anything could be. But yes, Northern Britain has an incredible um, share of these buildings. Uh, let's see, Rachel, um, have you thought about the connection of Western brutalism and traditional African architecture such as in Mali? Oh, that's interesting. Um, well, I guess, uh, concrete is a little bit like various kinds of, of rammed earth and other kinds of, of clay and, and earth um, architecture in that it uh, depends on its, st in its um, uh, stability on uh, being rather thick and it can be built by fairly unskilled workers. So um, I think that although there's probably no very little direct connection. I don't think that most of these architects that did buildings we call brutalists were thinking about African architecture. That's been something that's been uh, interesting to architects only much more recently. Uh, but I think there's some inherent logic of construction that's similar. Great, very interesting. Um, um, Really quick, Kurt, I think I only got a partial on your question there in the chat. So maybe if you want to put that in again. Um, uh, Mary Lou, as a graduate of the University of Illinois at Chicago, I have solely and begrudgingly developed a respect for brutalism. The behavioral sciences building was like a spider made of concrete. What is your favorite building at UIC? Oh, well, uh, I don't know, but that behavioral science building is certainly the uh, a, a, some kind of climax of um, concrete construction. It's, it's really a labyrinthine. By comparison, the humanities building is um, simple. <laughs> um, Jerry, uh, is it your feeling from what you know of the humanities building that its many structural and decaying parts make it unrealistic to upgrade? I don't think there's a structural problem. I think that there is a tremendous problem of insulation and uh, mechanical equipment, but I don't think it's structural. I think the building is basically sound and would probably last forever. Um, if we had a neutron bomb, I suspect that it would just um, stay there for, for thousands of years like the concrete buildings do. Um, I think it's the systems that are the, the real problem. The systems, the insulation, all of the things that make a building livable. <laughs> it will make a great ruin. Um, I think one of the reasons that it hasn't been demolished so far is because the, the cost of demolition would be enormous. It would be really hard to knock that building down. And I think one of the things, one of the arguments that preservationists make that I think is very potent is an environmental argument. They say that the greenest building is always, mm -hmm. almost always the building that's already there. If you think about the amount of embodied energy in that building, the amount of energy to tear it down, the amount of energy to build, to, to create all the materials and then build a new building, you're talking about a huge environmental impact. The relatively minor environmental impact to rehab the building, to insulate it, to put in uh, good thermal windows, to redo the mechanical system, um, is is a much greener solution, probably. A uh, question from Mark. You mentioned comments about humanities as being dark, heavy, confusing, etc. Can you comment how you would address those comments? Um, I was always impressed by the quality of materials, but the end result was troubling. 
Yeah, I think, and this again is very much the same problem that we've had at University of Illinois at Chicago uh, with these very complex buildings. I think that if they're pleasant spaces and the signage is good, that nobody objects to complexity and particularly in a university where you don't have um, new people coming in every day, it's mostly the same people that are using it. So I think if there were, if, if it were, um, um, if there were better floor materials, if, there, if the walls weren't so bare, if there was more art, if there was more landscaping, and if there was better signage, that you'd have a very different um, idea about it being confusing. Um, and the, because I don't think that complexity in itself is a problem. I think it's um, where you don't quite know where you are and you don't like where you are, that's the problem. <laughs> Um, okay, we've got a question from um, Kelvin Dickinson from the Paul Rudolph Heritage Foundation. Do you find younger people are more for preservation of these buildings or against them for not being sustainable enough? We found preserv preserving um, Rudolph's Boston Government Center to be difficult among others because younger architects and new urbanists think preserving them supports a political agenda. Hence, a, hence not suitable and would rather see them torn down? Um, I think if anything, uh, opinion among younger architects is, is um, going in favor of preservation generally and preservation of these buildings in specific. Uh, that Boston Government Center is um, a, a real masterpiece of architectural design. And we've seen in the past that um, almost always when it's a question of can an institution preserve a building that the people that are in the facilities management and, and maybe the architects of the building will almost always say the same thing. It leaks, it's unpleasant, it doesn't have good uh, heating and ventilating, but what we find is if there's a will to, to preserve these buildings, there's almost always ways to, um, to solve those problems, which are really in many ways fairly minor compared to the, the overall um, envelope of the building. Okay, and um, Steve, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Thanks, Jen. Uh, and thank you, Mr. Brugman, for your presentation. I uh, also am a fan of that building, uh, probably starting from uh, when it was under construction. We didn't have Twitter, <clears throat> but we had the four by eight panels around the building that regularly uh, were uh, decorated with anti-war graffiti. And uh, hopefully some of those were saved somewhere, but I haven't seen any around. Uh, I think you were onto something when you talked about the austerity of the building, the um, cost cutting. Uh, the buildings built around that time, including Vilas or Nolan Hall for zoology, were all built in that way with low ceilings, asphalt tile, uh, they in no way measure up to the beautiful buildings we have now, the school of human ecology or nursing. But I, I think there's another cross to bear for that building that um, it's a fun building on the exterior, especially when the, north, uh, the bridge on the south was up. Uh, it was, it's a building to walk through. It's kind of sculptural. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really had some beautiful features, but uh, the interior is not fun. It's dark. Um, it's not just the uh, bad insulation and the cheap windows and the poor heating and uh, ventilation. It's just not a fun building to be in. And uh, as a fan of it, I'd love to advocate for it because I um, uh, aligned with what you say about it being a green building to maintain. But um, what, what do you think was Mr. Weiss was thinking? Because it seems to go beyond cost cutting that the exterior is so much fun to walk through, but the interior is just so dark and austere. Yeah, I don't know. I think that's a legitimate criticism. And uh, I think that is something that any preservation architect would really have to work to overcome. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, good question, I don't know. Well, there would be some opportunities to cut some windows in those sure. uh, sloping walls on the first level. And, uh, you know, because I don't know where the, there are some uh, 
lights in there now, I, I don't see quite where they connect up with the inside, but otherwise it's, it's you know, I, I think it's underrated in terms of how, how many people interact with that building every day uh, to get up the hill, to walk up to the uh, bridge over Park Street. Um, you know, it's a very interesting construction from the exterior. Anyway, thanks for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. Um, another question here from Andrew. What lessons could humanities, um, oh my, humanities learn from the chasm in terms of warmer finishes and more welcoming spaces? What could the humanities learn? Uh, yep, I think the, the in comparison of the two buildings. Oh, oh, uh, what could you learn from the chasm? Okay, yeah, uh, yeah I, I think, um, uh, I think, yes, exactly. I think the, the materials, I, I know, for example, that there was going to be more limestone that was used. Um, and I know that uh, all kinds of um, uh, things that would have made the building more comfortable environmentally were cut. But I think generally, when you go into the chase and you, you have this feeling that the building, even though it doesn't have a lot of windows, but uh, there's a kind of golden aura to that building inside and a big uh, space that has fine materials that you can touch and um, look at. So um, I, I think that uh, if you could retrofit the humanities building with some of that finesse and, and not necessarily, you know, I don't, I'm not necessarily saying you go back to 1969. Um, I don't think there'd be any harm in, in actually doing some fairly dramatic uh, changes to the building um, and creating a lot more friendly surfaces and, and materials. Um, yeah, I think that's, a, that's exactly the, the spirit of, of what ought to be done if you're gonna save it. Uh, another question here from Kurt. What techn technological advances have occurred since humanities was designed that might make a real difference if put into place? Oh, wow. Um, uh, the, the whole construction world has changed dramatically. The, um, open, the windows are much more efficient. Uh, there's, uh, we can do things like um, we can now create uh, skylights that don't leak, which was not the case in the 1960s. Uh, uh, the whole, uh, almost every aspect of building, the, the sealants that, that can be used for the glazing, um, the, the uh, HVAC systems, just everything has been uh, revolutionized. That building is kind of, uh, it feels almost medieval in its construction by now because so much has changed. These buildings by people like Norman Foster and Richard Rogers, these high-tech buildings, um, that kind of new attitude, if you apply it to humanities, could probably uh, just change dramatically the 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 field in it. Yeah, um, we have a question here from uh, Preston. Um, thanks you for the presentation. And uh, which is your favorite architectural element of the humanities building? Oh, I really like the, oh, the, the configuration of the outdoor spaces and the way you walk through it and the various levels, the way that you can um, read the, the various parts of it. Um, from the outside, you can tell where the offices were, where the art studios were. I think it's a very intelligent building um, and, and a lot of just, just um, fun to, to walk through and, and to see. Is this Preston Schmidt, by the way? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah. well, thank you, Preston, for the wonderful <laughs> article in, um, on Wisconsin. That really was a very nice job you did. Yeah, that was an excellent piece. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that. And um, I think we're just coming up on eight o'clock. So um, Bob, did you have any closing remarks you wanted to make before I close it out? Um, no, just to say this was fun. And this was a, um, I've not been a great fan of Zoom, but um, this was one of the better sessions I've participated in and uh, a lot of really nice questions. So I'm, I'll be as curious as everybody there to see what happens to this, uh, to this building. <laughs> Yes, well, we're happy to hear that. I'm glad it went smoothly. We didn't have any technical problems. Um, thank you so much, Bob, for a fascinating presentation. Brutalism is a hot topic. Um, 
lots and lots of comments and we're so happy that everyone could join us. And again, if you um, want any more information about the Madison Trust or joining the organization, madisonpreservation.org is our website um, where you can find that information. And um, thank you so much, Bob. And thank you everyone for joining us again. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Good night.